Hallo liebe Formel 1 Fans und herzlich willkommen hier zu unserem Interview mit Juan Manuel Correa. Das Interview ist auf Englisch. Wer der englischen Sprache mächtig ist, kann jetzt gerne dranbleiben und das Interview verfolgen. Wir haben es aber auch auf Deutsch in schriftlicher Form. Klickt dafür einfach auf den Link in der Videobeschreibung. Ja, zwei Jahre ist es her, dass Juan Manuel Correa im Formel 2 Rennen von Spa mit Antoine Hubert kollidierte. Ja, ihr wisst ja, der Unfall hatte tragische Folgen. Hubert starb bei dem Crash. Correa wurde schwer verletzt, doch jetzt wagt er das Comeback in der Formel 3. Dort startet er am Wochenende unter anderem neben David Schumacher. Unsere F1 Insider Bianca Garloff und Michael Zeitler sprechen mit ihm über den Unfall und über seine Rückkehr. Viel Spaß. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and uh, congratulations for your comeback. Uh, you are driving Formula 3 this season and you already has, had your first tests. Uh, how does it feel to be back in the car, in the racing car? Yeah, thank you. Um It's it's been um, it's been a tough uh, start, you know, um, like like was expected, mm -hmm. but it, it has been great. I'm very very happy to be back uh, doing what I love and to be back in the racing driver lifestyle and and preparing for the season. Um, so mentally, I'm in a much better place than I was one year ago. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just really looking forward to to starting the season, but I'm very aware of the challenge that it will be. You know, I'm not expecting to have an easy season at all. Um, coming back from from the injuries and also from the long time away from racing is is a, a very big challenge, and, and I'm aware of that. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm welcoming the the challenge with open arms and uh, really anxious to to be at Barcelona in ten days. Yeah, how how did it feel to be back in the racing car for the first time? It, it, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. it, it was amazing. It felt kind of surreal to, to be back um, because it, it always looked like such a far away goal to, to be ready to drive. And there were always so many question marks on whether I would be able to do it, uh, what could go wrong with you know the injuries and if, if I would be physically able to accelerate and brake and a, a lot of these things, it's things we considered. So to just be there and be able to drive and slowly start to get into the rhythm with the car start to push it to the limit it was um yeah it, it was one of the best feelings I've, i've had in how far are you already at 100 percent, or do you still have any handicaps with your legs uh, how is it when you're driving i still have some pretty big handicaps um so i'm, I'm actually uh I'm, i'm gonna be handicapped for the rest of my life so mm -hmm. i have irreparable damage on, on my legs especially the right ankle is destroyed. I have barely no movement and that's not going to get any better. Uh, it will probably actually get worse over time. So that, that's a tough pill to swallow uh, from a, a personal life point of view. You know, it's something I'm going to have to deal with um, until I, I die. Um, but I, at the same time, I'm very lucky that I have just enough to, to accelerate and then push on the throttle and I am able to drive. There are some specific things when I'm driving that, for example, I cannot put the brake pressure I, I want to put, mm -hmm. which is making me lose a little bit of time still. So there's a small handicap on, on the lap time still. But um, it's things that they will, I, I believe they will be fixed with, with some more time, more laps and, and more rehabilitation. And I'm trying not to focus too much on that and not use that as an excuse at the moment because there's still so much I myself have to, to improve and get back on the rhythm. You know, I'm still not uh, not even close to being the driver I was in, in 2019, just before the crash. So my main goal is just to get back to that level uh, as soon as possible and then keep keep growing. How hard was the rehabilitation um, so far? What were the hardest moments in that one and a half year? Uh, I, I would say the hardest moments were the, the first few months when I had, well, in the beginning, my, my life was really hanging by, by, by a thread. Um, and, and that was tough. And I really, at some stages, I thought I was going to pass away. It, it was not looking good um, with my lungs and everything with the legs as well. Um, then even to save the leg was was a risky process. And the doctor even recommended to amputate the leg. Uh, but but I would say actually the hardest part was when I got back home to Miami and I was introduced back to normal life, you know, being in my house, 
this was also pre-pandemic so my friends were there and it, that's when it really hit me very hard on a psychological aspect because in the hospital, you know, you're there, you have these big metals on your leg, you're in, laying in a bed for two months. That, that, that was what I did. But you're in a, a very small bubble. And, you know, there are nurses there, there to help you. My parents were there with me. So you are not really thrown out into the world to deal with your disabilities and everything that you have to do to get back to a normal life. So that's why when I, I got to Miami, it was a lot to take. And it took me some months really to get myself out of that hole um to keep building the motivation to to come back even though i always knew i wanted to come back it, there were many many instances where I, I really had no motivation it seemed like it was not ending you know mm -hmm. it, it was just gonna keep on for going forever and it was impossible to to drive again um i was under very heavy medication for the pain because i was in constant pain 24 7 and the medication was also, you know, give me depression and anxiety and my moods were going up and down. So I, I really did not enjoy life for, for many months, but I just kind of kept, uh, kept thinking about the future and kind of kept thinking about this moment now, which is where I was going to prove many people wrong and, and come back and kind of retake my, my professional career, but also retake my life as a, as a person and do what I want to do with it. Um, so that's kind of what kept me going. Mm. Can you once again explain uh, how many surgeries you had and at which were your injuries? I think your back was, all, uh, back was also broken, right? Yeah, so I broke two vertebrae, uh, T6 and T7. Mm -hmm. I, well, internally in my organs, I had a lot of damage. My heart uh, had some water inside. My liver was very, very damaged. My, the biggest damage inside was, were my lungs. My lungs actually collapsed four days after the crash. Yeah, I remember. That's why I had to be in, a, yeah, in, a, in an induced coma for two weeks. And that was really the closest I have been to dying in, in this whole process was because of the lungs. Um, then my legs obviously were the most affected uh, fracture wise. Um, the, the left one was, it had a pretty big fractures but they managed to put a titanium metal through it the day after the crash mm -hmm. and stabilize it. And actually that's the only surgery I've had on, on my left tibia so far. And it's, it's okay. It's not a hundred percent, but it's, it's okay to walk and everything. Um, and the right tibia was what got really affected. So the, the last 10 centimeters of the tibia that went down to the ankle, they just basically shattered completely. They oh. became, you know, dust. Um, so that, I mean, just to give an idea of how bad it was in, in the first hospital in Belgium, they told me they were not going to be able to save the leg there. They thought it's probably impossible that someone can save it. But they, they told me literally, like they said, we, we left the, the leg there just in case you want to try to save it with somebody else, with a better doctor, because here we, we don't know what to do with it. Oh, God. So it, it was very destroyed. Yeah, I, I had bones sticking out all over the place. I had a big hole where the bone exploded out. Um, and, and that combined with a coma, mm -hmm. because it, it immediately I went into the coma, so they couldn't operate on my right leg. So when I finally got the operation, which was more than three weeks after the crash, they went in there and all the bones, all this little, little piece of bone, they were dead. They had to remove everything. Yeah. And I was missing, it ended up being almost 11 centimeters of, of tibia from from the right uh, tibia uh, my ankle like i mentioned to you it was completely destroyed thank god they managed to put a couple big pieces together and i kind of have an ankle right now and that's what allows me to move the, the foot i can move it maybe like this much oh god. um and then came the whole process of you know i went to london i i was lucky i had amazing doctors amazing like some of the best people for orthopedic surgeries operated on, on my leg so mm -hmm. i'm very grateful for that and um, they recommended even them to, to amputate the leg. I decided to, to try to save it. Uh, they, they managed to save it, but they told me, you know, if, if, we, if we do save it, the recovery process and the rehab is gonna be very, very long and painful. So really we kind of recommend for you to amputate it just so you don't go through all that because with an amputation in maybe two, three months, you're gonna be walking with a prosthetic leg. And that's when I thought about driving and I wanted to be able to push the throttle with my own leg. And I said, no, we, we have to save it. Um, and, and then 
again, the whole journey. So yeah, I, I think I, I've lost count. I, I say it's around 20 surgeries roughly um, that I've had. Uh, all of them have been with the legs. The, the back actually did not need surgery because I was in a, in a bed for two months after the crash. So the back healed itself, which was the only positive of being in a bed for so long. Um, the lungs recovered miraculously. Um, okay. I, I, I have to thank also myself for being so fit yeah. when, when I had the crash because that really saved my life. Uh, one, in the actual impact, but two, in, in the lungs, you know. I think the mortality rate for the machine I was in is, is near to 50% or something crazy like that. So, yeah, it, it was... Uh, that that part of, of it was, I would say, difficult, more difficult for my family when, when I was in the coma because I was not really aware of what was happening. And um, with that experience, um Have you any fears about another accident or how is your family dealing with that? For sure, I have fears about, about accidents. Um, it's something I never had before. I never had fears about, about accidents before. I felt like uh, uh, us drivers were invincible. And uh, you, you know the stories of, of you know, crashes, like obviously, you know, I can send Jules Bianchi, but you never really think it can happen to you now because every year there are new safety improvements and you i guess we we kind of made ourselves believe that because it's the only way that you can go out there and risk your life uh, you know every every race weekend every time you get in the car um but now i'm definitely much more aware of, of the risks i have experienced them firsthand but it, amazingly it has not turned into fear uh you know i There's something just for me about getting behind the, the wheel of the car. I feel so much in control. I have so much adrenaline. Um, it, it's like a drug and, and that kind of makes me not care about, about the, the fears or, or the dangers. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm keeping it that way. You know, there, like I said, there's no way I can be thinking constantly about fear and, and driving. So I try to just keep that side away. For sure for my family, it's not that easy, but I'm, I'm lucky that they're still, um, you know, backing me up and, 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 and helping me to follow my dreams. So I'm, I'm very lucky about that. You have also been uh, coming back to Spa last year. How was that for you? It, it was it was a lot. It, it, it was very emotional. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were certain moments, you know, like the, the minute of silence, uh, mm -hmm. the, the first time I saw Natalie, um, Antoine's mother, yeah. and, It was very emotional and very hard. Um, but really what drained me the most was just all the people around for, you know, for me, the the accident is something that I think every day, you know, since I've had the crash until now, there has not been a single day. I don't think about Antoine. I don't think about the accident. I don't think about my legs. You know, it's just a, a part of my life now. Uh, so when I got to spa, you know, for me, it wasn't it wasn't such a, a big news anymore, you know, like I, I had been dealing with exactly what happened one year ago for, for the last year by then. But for everyone around me, it was it was bringing a lot of memories that they never had to deal with, yeah. you know, yeah. and I really felt that I really felt that and everyone was very worried about me. And you know, that it was very nice of them. But it also started to bring some new feelings uh, out of me. And there were some things I had to deal with as well that I had been avoiding that whole time. Um, but overall, I am so happy I, I went because it kind of allowed me to get closure in, in a way and it allowed me to see all the people in the paddock, it allowed me to say thanks to the people I had to say thanks to, it allowed me to see Antoine's mother and, you know, it was kind of like a, a weight taken off my shoulder in a way and it, it also allowed me to sense again the, 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 the paddock and the, the mm -hmm. fuel and it gave me a bit of a push to for the next few months to get back into driving as well myself. Um, you, you talk about um, one, um, have you still contact with his family and what are they thinking about your comeback? I am actually, um, I, I've been in contact this whole time, um, here and there, we, we don't text uh, daily, but um, I, I think they're happy for me. I think they understand why I'm, I'm coming back. They obviously they, their son was a driver and they know how we are as, as drivers. Um, and I'm sure if Antoine was in, in my position, he would be doing the same thing and he would have achieved what, what I have achieved. 
because he was a very hard worker as well. Um, so, you know, his mom texted me to, to congratulate me. I shared also the pictures of my helmet for this year with her before I released it publicly because it has a big uh, Antoine tribute in the front and in the back. Um, and, you know, I think she's she's happy. I'm, I'm also with Antoine's old team, ART. He, he raised her in uh, 2018. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of things we, we have in common. Mm. Do you actually remember anything from the accident or have you analyzed it afterwards just to be sure if you made a mistake a mistake or not? I, I remember everything. I, I remember it perfectly. And uh, yeah, I, I, I have analyzed it many times. Um, I, I knew since, since the day after the crash that it wasn't my mistake. So I never felt, and, and I'm lucky about this, that I never felt uh, not even a single drop of guilt um which which helped me mentally uh, a lot because i think if if i would if i thought it was my fault or if it was my fault um it would have been much harder to recover mentally um but you know there was nothing i think really anybody can do and uh it's just one of those things where even if you planned To, to do an accident like that, you wouldn't be able to, to do it, you know, even if you, you were planning to. So, so many happen, things happen at, at the exact moment where they had to happen and wrong place, wrong time. And one thing that it was hard for me to, to accept was that, you know, just understand why it happened and, and why Antoine was dead and why wasn't I dead. That, that was, I would say, maybe the only guilt that I felt. It was like, why him and not me? You know what what gives me the right to be alive mm -hmm. and him just died out of nowhere you know he didn't even realize he was gonna die the way it happened it's just crazy so it, it made me think a, a lot about the deeper meaning of life and mm -hmm. uh, i still haven't found my answer but but here i am mm -hmm. and when when you say you still remember the crash you really remember afterwards uh, how you felt and how that was or was then a blackout yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I remember the actual crash, the impact. Um, I remember me taking myself out of the car because I, I crawled out of the car by myself using my hands. Oh, okay. I remember, I remember the, the pain. I, I don't remember really the feeling because I think it's, it's impossible for my brain to recreate that amount of pain and yeah. you know, even have a, you know, a, a measurement. But I, I just remember I, w I was thinking... Um, That if I would have a gun in my hand, I would shoot myself in the in the head, just to stop feeling that pain. So it, it was it was intense. It, okay. it was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the medics arrived, and I remember they. I asked them to put me to sleep, and I also remember the faces they were making when they were looking at my legs, and I knew it was not good. Oh, good. Um, uh, so it, yeah, it, it was a pretty. A, pretty traumatizing experience, to be honest. And, and then they put me to sleep there, right there in, in the pavement. Um, and or, or maybe they said they did me, I don't know, but after I, I, I don't remember anything. Uh, and then really, I have no memory of the few days right after the crash, before the coma. I have barely any memory of that. It's kind of all a blackout until I woke up from the coma around three weeks later. Mm -hmm. And even then, it took me like three or four days to regain consciousness from all the drugs that you have in, in the induced coma. Uh, and then it was just, yeah, trying to, asking a lot of questions. Um, I was lucky my parents were with me through the whole process. So, uh, you know, I wanted them to tell me exactly everything that had happened in the crash, after the crash, in the mm -hmm. hospitals, the coma, everything, you know, it took many days of you know just asking and answering because a lot was was going on um and then immediately we kind of got got into work with with the surgeons and I, i'm over age i was 20 when, when i had the accident so i had to make my own decisions of whether i wanted to save the leg amputate it what kind of treatment you know so yeah. um I, i kind of had to put my emotions aside in a way and just accept what had happened and, and tell myself okay you know this, this is what you have And you have to make the best out of it. You know, you can deal with other stuff a bit later, but right now you you, you need to pull through, mm -hmm. and, and that's what. And and have you had, uh, where where also your parents who told you that Antoine had died? Yes. So it, the first time, 
when I was in, in the hospital in Belgium, I, I don't remember this so much, but uh, it was actually not my parents. It was very early in the morning. They sent somebody, I think it was from the police, mm -hmm. um, from the Belgian police, because the police got involved because there was a death. And they told me, and I just broke down. I had no idea. Um, but but I kind of knew something was, was going on because in the hospital, they had covered all the TVs that were near my room because it, it was all over the news. So I was just there, you know, at the mercy of everyone else. And it was a horrible feeling. Um, and then I found out again after the coma, mm -hmm. when I came out, my subconsciousness knew. Um, and I just asked my mom, I said, Antoine died, right? And she was like, yes. And again, I, I just broke down. And yeah, it, it was emotionally, it was draining. So now, uh, yeah, coming back to racing again, you are driving in Formula 3, uh, also against a German boy, uh, David Schumacher. So what's what's your goal this season? To beat David Schumacher, that's my goal. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I, I have no no real goals result-wise. For me, it's very difficult to give you a, a number, a position. Um, I, I think in, in my goal priorities, number one is to to do the season without any medical issues from my legs, uh, without any other big incidents and, you know, just get through the season, um, first of all. Secondly, I just want to slowly go back to the driver I was, you know, and, and get back to the level I had. But it's going to be a long process. I'm not expecting that to happen in the first, second, third weekend, it, it, you know, it's 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 a big challenge uh but then of course i'm i'm a very competitive guy i'm a driver and i want to get podiums i, I want to try to win races and then i want to fight at the top um so that really is is my goal but i'm, I'm taking it with with patience but your main goal um still is formula one in the future yes yeah definitely Mm. And then you've also been a teammate of Mick Schumacher, our other German boy. What do you think about him now driving Formula One? And, and uh, I think you are also friends with him, right? Yeah, I, I, I was his teammate um, in Formula Four. Yeah. We, we, we know each other very well. Uh, I'm, I'm happy for him. It's great. Um, it's great for me to see some of these drivers that I have raced with um, in, in many other categories. And, and beep as well to be in Formula One and, and, and be successful in it because it, it really, I think it, it gives us the, the young drivers in F2 and F3 the credit that sometimes I don't think we get from the older drivers in F1, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think the level in, in racing is getting higher and higher every generation. And that's why you see many of these young kids go up to F1 and start beating the very experienced legends. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy for him. I, I really hope he can get a, a good seat. Uh, that, that's going to be the key uh, for, for his uh, career. But I think with a top team, he can win a world championship. He's, uh, he's talented, he's very dedicated, and uh, he has a lot of support behind him as well. So it would be great not only for him, but also for F1 in Germany, of course. Yeah, great. Okay, Juan, thank you very much. That was a really, really nice interview. Um, yeah, and also uh, personally for me, because I have been in Spa uh, when you had the accident. And uh, also for us journalists, um, it's uh, not so easy in these moments when uh, we have to experience dead drivers or even injured, uh, injured drivers. So I'm very happy to see you uh, like this now and to see you then back on track. Um, yeah, and maybe if the pandemic is over, uh, we will be at the track as well. And then, uh, yeah, say hello to you uh, in person. <laughs> 